Good morning, and welcome to the worship of God with First Baptist Church on this fifth Sunday after Epiphany. You might have noticed that we got a little bit of a late start this morning. I think the snow affected the uh, camera set up in the room here. Uh, we don't know what it was, but thanks to Phil and Robbie, uh, we got it uh, going this morning. I hope you're warm. I hope uh, you have electricity and uh, you're inside away from this snow that we've had this morning, but it sure is pretty out there today. Welcome to worship today. Um, we're glad to have you and we're glad to have a guest in the room today. Just one. Uh, he texted me on Wednesday uh, to ask if we were having church in person. And I said, yeah, come on down. Well, then we canceled service, but he was already on his way down anyway. Uh, the Reverend Bob Fox from CBF Kentucky is here. And because there's nobody else here for him to greet, uh, he's going to come up and offer a few words of greeting from our state level association. Good morning. I came here today to see you. And sadly, you're here to see me. But it is good to be at First Baptist Middleboro. We're proud to be partners with you in the gospel work in ways all around our state. One of the ways that First Middlesbrough has been very supportive over the years has been in their participation in Extreme Build. Uh, we've had some changes last year because of the pandemic, and I do have some good news that we are planning on doing Extreme Build again this year. We are going to do it in a more normal fashion. And so June the 8th, pre-build will, pre will begin, and basically the build itself, the whole thing, will be between June the 8th and June the 19th. So I hope you'll be able to think about marking off some of those days, all those days, to come and help us build a home in McCreary County for someone who needs it. Once again, it's wonderful to be at worship with you wherever you are, and we are so thankful that you're a part of our CBF Kentucky family that's following Christ together. On a normal Sunday, whatever that is, you would have gotten to shake Bob's hand and catch up with him. Most, many of you know Bob, uh, and he's good to come all the way to Middlesboro to visit us uh, from time to time. Bob, thanks for being here. Thanks for saying the words about Extreme Build. I can see in the camera lens that they are excited already. <laughs> Beloved, today is a communion Sunday. Uh, so uh, at some point before we get to that, which will be after the sermon, maybe you'll want to do that during the sermon, uh, make ready some bread and some cup to share communion together with us and with one another in your homes. Uh, as I imagine the disciples did when they got to that upper room and rummaged through the cabinets for whatever they could find to celebrate the Passover meal together. Uh, thanks for joining today, and let's begin our uh, worship time with these words based on Isaiah 40, one of the lectionary texts for today. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to us since the beginning? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Welcome to worship. Thank you. 
In worship, it is our custom to have a time of confession and assurance of forgiveness. We do this, as I often say, not because God is mad at us or because God will get us if we don't do it, but so that we remember our place in the created order and that we put on humility as we worship and as we go from this first day of the week into the rest of the week to live our lives. So, uh, with these words again from the psalm, uh, I'll call us to a time of confession together. We fool ourselves if we think that our ways are hidden from God. Therefore, let us confess our sin, trusting in the mercy of God our maker. Will you offer your prayer of confession as I pray for all of us together? God, you are everlasting, the creator of all that is. Your understanding is beyond measure. We confess to you that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. In your compassion, forgive us. For we place our hope in your steadfast love. When we confess our sins, we are assured of forgiveness because Christ made that so. We say together, quoting yet another psalm, Praise the Lord, our God heals the brokenhearted and binds up our wounds. God takes pleasure in those who place their trust in God's grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Oh, 
Today's first lesson comes from the first letter to the Corinthians. If I preach the gospel, I have no reason to brag since I'm obligated to do it. I'm in trouble if I don't preach the gospel. If I do this voluntarily, I get rewarded for it. But if I'm forced to do it, then I've been charged with a responsibility. What reward do I get? That's when I preach. I offer the good news free of charge. That's why I don't use the rights to which I'm entitled through the gospel. Although I'm free from all people, I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews so I can recruit Jews. I act like I'm under the law to those under the law so I can recruit those who are under the law, though I myself am not under the law. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law so I can recruit those outside the law, though I'm not outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ. I act weak to the weak, so I can recruit the weak. I have become all things to all people, so I can save some by all possible means. All the things I do are for the sake of the gospel, so I can be a partner with it. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. After leading, leaving the synagogue, Jesus, James, and John went home with Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed sick with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she served them. That evening at sunset, People were brought to Jesus who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons. But he didn't let the demons speak because they recognized him. Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. Simon and those with him tracked him down. When they found him, they told him, everyone's looking for you. He replied, let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. He traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and throwing out demons. Since 1851, the Armed Forces Retirement Home has been located four miles north-northeast of the White House, about four miles east of the Washington National Cathedral, which wasn't commissioned until President Theodore Roosevelt laid the first foundation stone in 1907. In 1851, the Soldier's Home, as it was originally called, was commissioned by the federal government under pressure from activist groups to house the wounded of the nation's wars. Ten years later, in 1861, Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as the 16th President of the United States. 
The Soldiers' Home, still there today in Washington, D.C., is a national historical site. It is a 35-room Gothic Revival-style building that was originally nestled in the D.C. countryside outside the hustle and bustle of the city. Today, it is nestled between a park and a cemetery in the sprawl of the nation's capital. And yet, it is still today remarkably natural, as it was when President Lincoln retreated there during his time in office. In the summer and early autumn of 1862, 1863, and 1864, Lincoln resided at the soldier's home. He would pass by two companies of the 150th Pennsylvania Volunteers camped on the lawn to provide protection for the president as he commuted back and forth to the White House on horseback. On his ride, he would see in the distance the dome of the U.S. Capitol, only partially completed. President Abraham Lincoln came to the Oval Office at a time like no other time in U.S. history. For him, there were no hundred days in which the executive had time to settle in, appoint staff, and begin rolling out an agenda. Lincoln didn't even have time to discover which light switch worked which lamp or which door went to the restroom. In Lincoln's own words, quote, the first thing that was handed to me after I entered this room when I came in from the inauguration was the letter from Major Anderson saying that the provisions would soon be exhausted. Major Anderson was the commander of a besieged federal armory called Fort Sumter in South Carolina. One Lincoln scholar writes that in addition to the foreboding threat of civil war, Lincoln was not free from the other, less weighty obligations of his office. This scholar wrote, virtually from Lincoln's first day in office, a crush of visitors besieged the White House stairways, corridors, climbed through the windows at levees, and camped outside Lincoln's office door. They were looking for jobs. They were looking for favors. Many of them were Mary Todd Lincoln's acquaintances. The American Civil War broke out in earnest in the midst of all that on April 12, 1861, 39 days after Lincoln was sworn in and received Major Anderson's letter. In the summer and early autumn of 1862, 1863, and 1864, President Lincoln resided four miles from the White House in the D.C. countryside. Today, I can't imagine us doing anything else but calling him lazy for that. What's he think he's doing spending 25% of his time away? Doesn't he know that times like these call for the president to be in the White House every second of every day laboring for the people? Only if he had done that, what we would almost certainly have accused him if he had done that, we may not have the republic that we have today. Cal Newport, who I've been reading lately, claims that a growing amount of research suggests that the time and space of quiet reflection at the cottage, at the soldier's home, may have played a key role in helping Lincoln make sense of the traumas of the Civil War and take on the hard decisions that he faced. 
our anxious clamoring against any semblance of solitude, it turns out, may be what undoes us. The notion that work can look like three months a year retreating to a countryside cottage simply does not register with our modern mechanized views of ourselves and our world. It's little surprise to me that Cal Newport, who lives and works at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., would look to a U.S. president as an exemplar. Given Lincoln's upbringing and the content of his speeches, I think Lincoln got the idea from Jesus. Little surprise to you to hear Zach Bay, the pastor in Appalachia, say that, right? I don't think it's a hard sell. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is riddled with biblical allusions. Most U.S. presidents have long borrowed beautiful image from the Bible. Most U.S. presidents have used that, even if they didn't cite it, to inspire the nation, even when the nation didn't know where it came from. I think Lincoln got his idea for solitude from Jesus. In Mark's gospel lesson today, we read in Mark 1.35, early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. As a student of the Bible, I've long known that there were a few verses similar to this one sprinkled throughout the New Testament Gospels. What I didn't realize until I put my mind to it in my study this week is that in Mark's Gospel, they are far from a few. In Mark's Gospel alone, Jesus appears to be trying to do what Lincoln did no fewer than 13 times in 16 chapters, and perhaps as many as 18 times in 16 chapters. Jesus seems to be consistently trying to get away from the crowds that are pushing in around him for a little Lincolnian solitude. He does it four times in chapter 1. Once in chapter 2, twice in chapter 3, twice in chapter 6, once in chapter 7, once in chapter 9, and twice in chapter 14. If you cross-reference Peter's confession of, as, of Jesus as the Messiah with Luke's telling of that story, you can add another instance of Jesus doing it in Mark 8. If you make some assumptions about travel time and geography in the ancient world, you can add three more in Mark's gospel. If you include the silence and solitude of the cross, it brings the total to 18. That last one is kind of a tough sell for me, as if Jesus were retreating to be with his own thoughts on the cross. So let's say 17 times. 17 times in 16 chapters, Mark shows Jesus, like Lincoln after him, attempting to retreat from the crowds and the towns to the countryside, to the deserted places, with his own thoughts and with God. Early in the morning, Mark says, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went off to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. This is not a one-off occurrence. It's not an occasional vacation for Jesus. As Mark tells Jesus' story, solitude is a deeply integral part of Jesus' life and work. Jesus' times were no less fraught, no less troubled than Lincoln's, and yet both of these great people 
committed themselves to the practice of solitude. I've wondered all week, after being startled by Lincoln's absence from the White House during the Civil War, after being equally startled by the frequency of Jesus escaping into deserted natural places, I've wondered all week what makes us in our modern hubris think that we don't need to bother with what one of the greatest U.S. presidents and our Lord and Savior spent a great deal of time bothering with. I've wondered that all week. How do we get out of it when Abraham Lincoln and Jesus Christ were committed to it? How do we work that in our hearts and in our minds? One thing I think bears remembering is the way we talk about our hearts and our minds and our bodies. The way we use mechanical metaphors for our human brain and our human body. Nicholas Carr, in his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, takes this pervasive mechanical metaphor to task. It is an advent of the Industrial Revolution, he says, when humans began to innovate the steam engine and all the machinery that went around it to use its power, we, we began to supplant our, our previously organic metaphors for ourselves and our world for mechanical ones. We shifted from conceiving of our thoughts as something like a vine growing on a frame to a networked computer or a watch in the industrial era full of gears ticking and doing something. In the internet age, of course, it became a networked computer. That metaphor that appeared closer to how our brains work, uh, it, it kind of thinks, it kind of does that. We began using phrases, metaphors like, I'm wired to. I need to process this idea. My brain is full. And I need a little time to unplug. All mechanical, networked, computer ideas overlaid onto the way we see ourselves. The body is a machine, we say. My knee, shoulder, hip is worn out and needs to be replaced. You know, like interchangeable parts on Henry Ford's assembly line. Or in a sports metaphor, he or she is a machine, and we mean it as high praise when we say it. The problem, Carr's argument would say, is not that knee replacements are bad or that we need to rest. It's that in conceiving of our bodies for the first time in human history as something inorganic, non-living, we destroy our link to the natural world around us. And for the purposes of this sermon, when we do that, we malign an idea like solitude. You can't help it because machines don't need solitude. Never mind that the trees outside take a three month break from doing anything every single year, just like Lincoln did at that cottage in the Civil War, we don't think of ourselves like the trees anymore. We think of ourselves like our car, our computer. But are we? This sermon can't produce an easy answer or a quick fix to this. That's not what solitude does for one thing. But solitude is most assuredly work, 
I promise you that. We think of solitude as laying on the beach in the sand by ourselves, resting, but solitude is work. Lincoln was processing the traumas of the Civil War and trying to put his head around the big decisions. Jesus was alone praying to God, assuming, uh, assumedly doing the same thing. Solitude is work. It's just not the kind of work that we even have on our radar anymore in our world of mechanized metaphors. Philosopher Frederick Nietzsche was famous for his long ambling walks in the mountains. And his uh, famous saying for that practice was, the only thoughts that matter, that have value, are reached while I'm walking. In the woods, in the mountains, he would say. And he did it for hours and days on end. Nietzsche was talking about solitude. Not a few of those instances of Jesus retreating in Mark's gospel have him walking. Several of them have him walking along the sea, in the desert, along a long wilderness road between two places. Solitude is work. It's just work of a different kind. And in our world of mechanized human bodies and computerized human brains, we have given up all but on that work. The idea of retreating to a cottage for three months a year is literally unthinkable to modern American culture because the value of a machine or a computer is in what it produces per minute per day without a break. Beloved, this sermon can't possibly produce an easy answer or quick advice regarding this phenomenon today. But it may, this sermon, haunt you with the question that you will need to go and meditate on with the help of the Holy Spirit, the question that has haunted me all week long in the study. What do we lose when we conceive of ourselves as a machine and use language that reinforces that conception? It is a scientific fact that you are not a machine. It is a theological truth that your value does not come from what you produce. I want to say that again because it's important. It is a scientific fact that you are not a machine, and it is a theological truth that your value does not come from what you produce. But if you're like me, the moment you stop, the moment you let your mind stretch out and wander, you begin to think negatively about yourself and your mind. Things like, what a weak machine that can't keep going. Why, 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 can't, I, why can't I get my mind to go today? If you're like me, the moment you can't jump up and run around the house chasing your kids for the ninth hour of the day, or go and do housework, or go and do the lawn work that needs to be done. The moment you can't get to work that day that you don't feel up to it, you begin to think negatively about your body. It's such a weak machine to need rest like that. And then, insidiously, if you're like me, you anxiously press on. It's a scientific fact that you are not a machine. Abraham Lincoln seemed to know that. It's a theological truth that your value does not rest in what you produce. Jesus seemed to know that. So that question again, 
What do you lose when you conceive of yourself as a machine and use language that reinforces that conception? Obviously, we lose the capacity for solitude. It is almost extinct in our world. Arguably, we lose our capacity to be human along with it. So I told you at the beginning of the service that we would do communion today together. I hope you found uh, some bread and some cup or some goldfish and whatever it is you have at your house to do that. Communion is something that a machine doesn't need. Communion is something that a human body does need. Communion with other people, bread and wine, taken together. Communion is something that your smartphone, your car doesn't need, but that you do. And today we're welcomed by Christ around Christ's table once again on this Sunday. At First Baptist Church, we long ago decided that we, our job at the communion table is simply to pull out the chair. We're not the host, we're just the servers. And so whoever you are, wherever you are, Baptist or not, Christian or not for that matter, if you wanna join us today at Christ's table and taste and see that God is good, we invite you to do that. Take hold of the bread that you found today. Uh, take hold of that for this time of communion uh, as we lean in around Jesus' table. In the story, Jesus is sharing his last meal with his disciples, reclining at the table, enjoying conversation, engaged in religious ritual. And he takes the bread on the table, a very common piece of food in his world. He takes it and he says to his disciples, take this all of you and eat it. In this bread is my body given for you, broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, remember me. So we take Jesus up on that and eat the bread together now. And in the same way, as if to make the point again, 
Jesus, with his disciples still gathered at the table, took the cup, another very common thing in the ancient world, that cup of wine. Jesus took it and said of it, this cup is the new covenant poured out for you, poured out for many. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. And so, as Jesus asked, as Jesus teaches, we drink the cup, this common cup, and remember Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we have caught a glimpse of, uh, of you slipping away from the crowds, going out into the desert to be alone with your own thoughts and to be alone in prayer. And we know, we admit, that we don't do that anymore. Not enough, not as many times as Jesus did it in Mark's gospel. We say that today, God, uh, hoping that you will help us to begin to give ourselves some grace. The grace that comes from seeing ourselves with better metaphors than those in our popular culture right now. Metaphors of life and growth and pruning and more growth and fruit rather than metaphors of gears and oil and circuits and electricity. Help us, God. Give ourselves the grace this day to look out the window and notice the trees taking a season off to rest. And help us to see Jesus trying to teach us to do that today. God, thank you for inviting us again to your table to taste and see things machines don't do, that you are still present among us and that you are good. We join our voices in reply. In one bold church voice spread out all over Middlesboro, as we pray as you taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
justice and joy for young and for old a place at the table a voice to be And now as you prepare to go from this place, remember the words from the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. And the Word became flesh. That's what you are. And that is good news. May the strength of Christ uplift you the comfort of the Holy Spirit surrounds you, and the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage this day and every day as you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>